thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. We're going to have, I think, another great uh, engaging expert session here. I'm going to uh, get started by sharing my screen. Oh, I think I've got the disabled message here. So if we can... Switch that back on. In any event, they, when the Wrights uh, joined the bicycle business, we should say that they were joining a booming business. Uh, America was in love with bicycles in the 1890s. And by, well, I think, 1895, there were over 300 different manufacturers in the U.S. producing something like 1.2 million bicycles every year. So it was a, a big business. And uh, there we go. We're going to Get my screen up there. There. Hopefully, everybody's seeing my uh, slides now. We'll jump in with the title here and hopefully get rolling. There we go. So, as we said, the Wrights had joined a, a booming business, right, with something like 1.2 million bikes being made and sold in the U.S. every year. Uh, the Wrights uh, sold bicycles and bicycle accessories. They repaired bicycles. And for a time, they even built some bicycles under their own brand names. And we'll take a look at all of that. Uh, before we get started, though, I did want to take a moment and uh, acknowledge the, the passing of, of David McCullough, who died over the weekend. Uh, McCullough, very well known as an author, written some exceptional books on uh, the Panama Canal, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Johnstown Flood, biographies of Presidents Harry Truman and, and John Adams. But uh, one of his last projects, published in 2015, was a biography of the Wright brothers. And uh, it, it's an excellent place to start if you're looking for uh, an enjoyable read uh, to give you some background on the Wrights and their accomplishments. And uh, he did visit the Henry Ford a couple of times as he was researching the book and then came back and uh, favored us with a, a presentation on the book after it was finished and published in 2015. So it was a great uh, privilege and a great honor to have him here. Uh, and as you see in the photo, he's posed in the right cycle shop in Greenfield Village here. So uh, we will miss him, but we are grateful for his uh, legacy. And of course, his books, I'm sure, will remain in print for years to come. Um, that said, we'll uh, go back to our friends, Orville and Wilbur Wright. We see this photo of the two of them sitting on the porch of their home in Dayton, Ohio, about 1910. And I just wanted to start by noting that the bicycle business wasn't the brothers' first enterprise. In fact, their first business was a print shop uh, opened in 1889 with a printing press that had been built by Orville. Uh, the brothers published their own newspaper, and, uh, and then they focused uh, more or less on commercial printing, printing things for other people. Um, they entered the bicycle business in the midst of a, a nationwide bike boom, as we talked about there in the introduction. But uh, the boom didn't just come out of, of nowhere. It was a fad that was rooted in technological developments throughout the 19th century. So as a part of our presentation, we'll just take a look at some of those developments that uh, led the bicycle to evolve to where it could become so popular in the 1890s. And uh, we'll start with one of the first. Uh, this is the oldest bicycle in our collection, and we can't really even call it a bicycle other than in just the basic crude uh, form of the thing. But this is a Draisine built around 1818. And this is the product of German inventor Karl von Drais. And I would say it's the first direct ancestor to the modern bicycle, uh, introduced in 1817. And as you see, there are no pedals, there's certainly no chain, no sprocket, no drive mechanism of any kind. In fact, a rider on a Draisine would simply sit on the seat, put their hands on the uh, handlebar there, and then scoot along with their feet. So uh, perhaps not the most efficient vehicle, but you could move faster uh, than walking for sure. And, and we should say, uh, uh, Von Dreis, he preferred to call the, the vehicle a Draisine, but most folks referred to them as Velocipedes, which is uh, taken from the Latin word uh, Velox pedis, meaning swift of foot. Uh, we're skipping ahead here to the next iteration here. This photo was taken in 1913, but we're taking a look at a vehicle that was introduced in the mid 1860s, uh, about 50 years earlier. This is uh, Pap Lord and his Bone Shaker, a Velocipede of the Civil War era. Uh, it was French blacksmith uh, Pierre Michaud who made the key improvement in the mid-1860s to the Draisine when he attached pedals to the front wheel. And I think you can just barely make them out in the photo, but these are not, uh, this is not a chain drive. The pedals aren't there under the seat as we're used to in a modern bicycle. They are connected directly to that front wheel. So you'd sit there with your feet forward and scoot along. But a, an incredible technological breakthrough because riders could now propel the vehicle without touching their feet to the ground. 
Uh, but the solid wheels and the rough ride of the uh, the bone shaker left a lot to be desired. Uh, they called them bone shakers for a reason, after all. Our uh, next advancement comes uh, oh, in the uh, mid-1870s with the high wheel bicycle. We're looking at an example here from about 1878, and this is one that is in the Henry Ford's collection. Uh, the high wheel brings another round of uh, enhancements. Some of them technological, uh, like the lighter tubular steel frame. Uh, others added to comfort, the smoother uh, solid rubber tires, not inner tube tires, mind you, but solid rubber, still much better than a, a wooden tire or a uh, iron rimmed wheel on a wooden tire. Gives a much more forgiving ride. And uh, the great advantage here, also the disadvantage with the high wheel, which we'll talk about in a moment, but the fact that that wheel is so large. Now, as you're pedaling with your feet, you uh, turn at the same rate those pedals, but because the wheel is so much larger, you're covering more ground and going faster with each crank of the pedals. So uh, an important thing. But of course, it took a great deal of skill to mount and dismount a high wheel bicycle. You really have to, uh, you'll see there's a little footstep there in the back over that smaller rear wheel. You kind of have to push the thing along with one foot sitting on that uh, that rear step. And then once you kind of get up to speed, you launch your other leg up over and uh, sit yourself down in the saddle. And uh, take it from me, I, I had a chance to ride one of these a few times. Uh, when you climb up into that saddle, you have to commit. You have to start pedaling very quickly. You do not want to fall from one of these machines. The next great improvement on the high wheeler was uh, really the modern bicycle as we would recognize it today. Uh, we're looking at a Pope Columbia safety bicycle from the museum's collection, uh, built about 1889. Uh, for what it's worth, this bike is on display in the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation. It's right at the uh, introduction to the Driving America exhibit. It's just in fact hanging from the ceiling right in front of the horse car. So you don't want to miss that next time you're visiting. Uh, the safety bicycle uh, appeared in the mid 1880s, probably obvious why it's called a safety bicycle. Now you've got two wheels of the same size. It sits much lower to the ground, so easier to get on that bike, easier to get off of it. And a uh, fall is not going to be nearly as dangerous as it would be from a high wheel bicycle. Uh, the real breakthrough here, in addition to the equally sized wheels, is the chain drive propulsion system. Now we have a sprocket here on the crank with the pedals, a chain going to the back, and we're using now two different gears so we can use the mechanical advantage of those two gears to essentially replicate the efficiency of the high wheel bicycle, but without that high wheel. You're still moving that rear wheel faster and farther per each crank of the pedal, but this time thanks to the different gears. And it really was the safety bicycle that, that made the bicycle such a craze in the United States. Uh, it made cycling more accessible than it had ever been before. Women and men alike enjoyed the freedom of traveling under their own power on their own schedules, which is something we take for granted today in our, our automobile world. Uh, but in the 1890s, if you were traveling, you'd be used to a railroad timetable, uh, perhaps a stagecoach timetable, or uh, if you're in the city, a streetcar or an interurban railway timetable. But with a bicycle, you hop on, you ride off wherever you want. Uh, this is where the idea of a sort of Sunday ride catches on, right? You go out and it's just the travel itself that is the pleasure. And the safety bicycle made all of that happen. Uh, and in fact, it, it inspired the good roads movement, right? There were organizations of cyclists who wanted to start paving roads, not just in the cities, but between cities so that it would give them a more pleasant riding experience. And that good roads movement later adopted by uh, motorists or automobile drivers in, uh, in the next decade. And uh, it's interesting that a lot of bicycle riders in the 1890s referred to the sensation of riding a bicycle pedaling along at speed as being like flying or what they would have imagined flying to be like. And of course, the Wright brothers would soon appreciate that uh, description in a way that no one else really could. We're looking here at a catalog for Columbia Bicycles, this catalog published in 1892, which not coincidentally is the year that the bike boom arrived at the Wright home in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Orville purchased a brand new Columbia bicycle uh, for $160 that year. And uh, Wilbur soon thereafter bought his own bike, but Wilbur perhaps being a little more uh, economical purchased a used Columbia for about $80 or half the price that Wilbur paid. And uh, the brothers quickly came to enjoy riding in and around Dayton. Uh, they enjoyed taking long trips out in uh, the countryside. Uh, Orville was something of a speed demon. He competed in a couple of bicycle races. Uh, Wilbur generally preferred those more tranquil country rides. 
And just because it's fun, here's a photo from inside that Columbia catalog there. Why should I ride a bicycle? And, and they, some interesting uh, answers here, one of which a sound body and mind for the price of a bicycle is a good investment. Or bicycling is a popular, clean, healthy sport. And a wheel is good company. Uh, the benefits are manifold. It's results uh, uniform. It's exhilarating. It's stimulating. And maybe my favorite here that the uh, the man of sedentary habits throws off the confinement of the office and seeks relief in the enjoyment of nature. Uh, we wouldn't use the same language, the same exact wording in our bicycle ads today, but the principle is the same. Here's a way for you to get out, exercise, get some fresh air and uh, enjoy it while you're doing it. Uh, we're looking here, of course, a photo again of Wilbur and Orville taken at the same time as that first photo we saw in 1910, and then a photo of their father taken a few years later. Uh, the Brights were mechanically inclined, even from a young age, and we mentioned already how Orville had built his own printing press. It should perhaps not be surprising then that many of their friends began coming to the Wrights asking for help with bicycle repairs, and uh, the brothers astutely sensed an opportunity there. And it was uh, in October of 1892 that Wilbur approached Milton Wright, their father, and said, you know, I've got an idea, Dad. Uh, what if we get into the bicycling business? He uh, proposed that the brothers open up their own shop. And uh, Bishop Wright, who I think also recognized the business opportunity there and appreciated the industriousness on his son's behalf, uh, he was all about the idea. He gave them uh, his blessing, so to speak. And we're looking here, of course, at the famous Wright Cycle Shop in Greenfield Village, though it's important to note this is not their first cycle shop. Their first shop was located at 1005 West 3rd Street, whereas this is 1127 uh, West 3rd Street. In fact, they had a couple of different locations before they settled here in this building. Uh, one of them at 22 William Street is still in Dayton, and the National Park Service has now converted that into a wonderful visitor center. So if you're in Dayton, by all means, check it out. Uh, depending on what source you read or, or which biographies you read, you might see that the Wrights opened their cycle shop in 1892. You might see that they opened it in 1893. Well, which year is it? The answer is, is both. <laughs> you can make a credible case. They actually signed the rental agreement for their first shop in December of 1892 and began stocking the shelves with bicycles and, and merchandise. They didn't actually open it to the public until the following spring of 1893. Obviously, people aren't riding very often in the winter time, so it made sense to hold off on the formal public opening until the springtime. I uh, mentioned the brothers had been in, in several different locations. In fact, they operated uh, a couple of, of shops simultaneously for a while. They had one that was basically a showroom where they would sell bicycles and then another where they would do all of the work. They didn't move into this uh, 1127 West 3rd Street building until 1897, but they remained there until the bicycle business closed in 1908. And of course, famously, it's where they did their aviation work and built uh, their first gliders and, and airplanes. So clearly that's the, uh, the shop to preserve if you're going to choose just one to move to Greenfield Village. We're looking now inside the bicycle shop as it looks today in Greenfield. There's this photo taken in 2007, but of course it doesn't look all that different today. Uh, the Wrights were believers in quality, and we should say that Wright Cycle Company really specialized in higher-end bicycle brands. We know they carried brands like Coventry, Duchess, Fleetwing, and, and Warwick. Uh, we, we mentioned the Columbias that they bought. They, I don't think they carried Columbias, at least not as brand new bikes, because those were uh, somewhat more affordable. The brothers you, know, you paid more for one of their bicycles. In fact, some of the bikes that the brothers sold uh, cost as much as $100, which this is at a time when the average annual American wage is less than $450. So $100 is a, a serious investment. Uh, realizing how costly it was, though, the brothers did uh, have payment plans they offered. You could buy a bike on time, as they said in those days, or uh, they also accepted customer trade-ins toward the purchase of new bikes. And, and this is really quite interesting. The brothers would accept inexpensive or, or frankly poorly made bicycles in trade for a better quality machine, but they would then not sell what they thought was a poor quality bike. So sometimes they were taking trade-ins just as a straight loss. So uh, it speaks to their, their belief in quality. It wasn't about higher profits, making more money. It was because they generally believed that these were better quality bicycles and they only wanted their names and reputations associated with well-made products. Uh, we're looking here at uh, a set of bicycle spokes that were used by the brothers at their uh, shop. 
Uh, initially, they struggled with the seasonal nature of bicycle sales, which we mentioned earlier here. Uh, but they also struggled against growing competition from other bike shops. There weren't many in Dayton when they opened the first in uh, 1893. But of course, very quickly, they had competition growing up uh, aside, around, all around them, I should say. Uh, the brothers had some financial difficulties in the mid-1890s. In fact, at least on one occasion, they had to borrow money from their father. And Wilbur actually thought about getting out of the business altogether to uh, go off and become a teacher, which had been an idea he'd been thinking about on and off really since he graduated high school. Uh, but the brothers managed to turn the business around. They got used to the seasonal rhythms of the sales. Uh, they developed a series of imaginative advertisements. And they drew on their experience and equipment, frankly, as printers and started uh, publishing a weekly cycling newsletter with copious advertisements for right cycles in it, for sure. But to all of those strategies improve the bicycle sales. And um, before we move on to the next slide here, you know, a lot of people will will ask curators why it is they bring different things into the collection. And you'll hear curators say, well, well, I acquired this because this artifact tells a terrific story. When I look at it, it, it kind of speaks to me. I can assure you that these artifacts spoke to me. That's the nice thing about these remote presentations. I don't have to hear the groans, which I know are there right now. Uh, so moving ahead from the spokes, we're looking here at uh, the big development in uh, Wright Cycle Company, which came in 1896. And this was a part of what improved their sales and their general financial outlook. The Wrights began building their own bicycles right there on site under their own brand names. And uh, this was a logical thing to do, obviously, not only because of the additional profits, but because they had quite a bit of free time in the winter. They could build their bikes, their inventory for the following spring over the winter time and have things stocked up on the shelves by the time the uh, shop opened again. The Wrights uh, were working a bit like 19th century artisans. They built each bicycle more or less to order, uh, hand making parts with just a few basic tools as well as a few machine tools we'll look at in a moment. Uh, the first brand they introduced was the Van Cleve. We're looking at a Van Cleve, which is in the museum's collection now. And uh, they incidentally in, on view in the Wright Cycle Shop, I should say, which is exactly where it should be displayed here on our campus. Uh, they named the Van Cleve for uh, family ancestors who had been really one of the first white settlers in the state of Ohio. So proud of their family heritage with the Van Cleve. We're looking here at a catalog for the Van Cleve. You'll notice here that the price uh, for the basic model is $47. Uh, when it was introduced uh, a few years earlier, this catalog from 1900, it was introduced in 1896. The initial price was between $60 and $65. So we're seeing prices fall. Uh, not so much because the, the quality of the bike has fallen, but because the bicycle fat itself is beginning to wane. So how do you increase sales? Well, one way to do it is to, to cut the price. Um, another photo inside, uh, one of the real advantages of the Van Cleve, or so the brothers advertised, was that they featured high-grade materials and uh, durable enamel finishes. They also employed special oil retaining hubs and coaster brakes that the brothers had designed. And, and those oil retaining hubs are called out here on the uh, left side. And uh, they say that, you know, unlike most bicycles where you had to oil the hubs perhaps every time you went off to ride them or perhaps on a weekly or monthly basis, they say you won't have to oil our hub for two years. So uh, quite an advantage in terms of lower maintenance, even if it did come at a bit of a price. Uh, and we mentioned to the coaster brakes now. So you could pedal uh, by turning the pedals backward to activate a brake, which is the way most uh, single speed bikes still operate today. Uh, if you get into a multi gear bike, then you're using probably a caliber brake or even a disc brake, depending on the, uh, the price point at which the bike is sold. Another uh, great catalog here. And again, it's just fun to read some of the uh, sales literature there. and. Uh, we're talking uh, on the first page in the first paragraph, the brothers say the past year has been one of great change in the bicycle business. The craze for trusts, aka large bicycle manufacturers, uh, has been sweeping the country and affected the bicycle trade. Uh, essentially, what they're saying here is when you buy from us, you're bu not buying from a nameless, faceless corporation. You're buying from two individuals who know the business and who will put more experience, more expertise, and more care into your bicycle. So again, we wouldn't use that kind of language today, but that same pitch you will see used uh, to this day for various products. 
Uh, the bikes or the Wrights rather introduced a second bicycle brand uh, not long after the Van Cleve appeared on on the scene in the form of the St. Clair, and this is their lower priced model, uh, sold for somewhere around forty two, forty three dollars compared to the sixty dollars for the Van Cleve. And uh, this bicycle was named for Arthur St. Clair, who governed the Northwest Territory from 1788 to 1802, been a hero in the American Revolution prior to that. Uh, but it would seem that the St. Clair was less popular than the Van Cleve because it was discontinued in 1899, so only on the market for a few years. This St. Clair is also in our collection, though I will say it is not on display at the Henry Ford right now. For many years, this bicycle has been on view in the National Air and Space Museum of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So if you go visit their, their uh, sort of flagship museum right there on the National Mall, you will see this bike displayed literally in front of the original 1903 Wright Flyer. So that's, a, 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 just to say, a very uh, a proud place to have this bicycle on view. I also need to say you're looking at uh, something we're going to talk about here later in a moment, the uh, third wheel sitting on top of those handlebars uh, was not standard equipment on the St. Clair bicycle. This is, bike has been modified for the Wright's aeronautical experiments, which we'll talk about here in a moment. We're looking now at a picture of uh, Orville Wright and uh, his, his old childhood friend, Edward, uh, Edwin Sines, who uh, worked in the cycle shop along with him. Uh, this photo taken about 1897, but I love it because we see bicycle bits and pieces all around them. Uh, presumably they're they're grinding or polishing bicycle frames here because we see some frames along the right side of the photo. We can see another one up here on the uh, on the clamp on the left side of the photo. And then we see uh, uh, looks like a, a drill over here, but then some sprockets for for chain drives up hanging along the wall. So uh, nice to see them literally at work on bicycles in this photograph taken, uh, this was taken well, probably in the, it could have been 22 Williams or it could have been the 1127 uh, shop site because this is the year in which they moved to that that uh, final building. And uh, we mentioned, I want you to go back. We mentioned how each bike was more or less a custom job uh, built by the brothers. And we should say how it worked. Uh, the brothers sold either men's or women's bikes depending on what you wanted to order. Uh, your frames, your wheels, uh, the cranks, and the hubs were all made by the rights in-house. The handlebars, seats, and tires, though, would have been selected by a customer based on inventory that was carried in the shop. So things produced by other manufacturers that the Wright brothers sold, you would choose which tires, which seat you wanted so that they could put it all together to your specifications. And the rights were by no means mass manufacturers. They made perhaps about 300 bikes altogether between 1896 and 1900. And of those, I believe a grand total of seven survive. So a uh, few of them out there in the world. I know, I think there are three of them uh, preserved in Dayton in various places. We obviously have two of them and uh, there are two more floating out there somewhere, but uh, suffice it to say a, a rare, rare machine. We were talking about hand tools. Well, the Wrights also had a modest selection of machine tools that they used as well, though they did not power them with electricity. Even at the turn of the 20th century, Wright Cycle Company had no power. Uh, lighting came from natural gas, which was piped in from city lines, and the Wrights used that same gas to operate this single cylinder engine. And we're looking at a drawing of uh, the replica of the engine, which was made when Henry Ford was building, rebuilding, reassembling the Wright Cycle Company out in Greenfield Village in 1937, but true to the original. And that original single cylinder engine had been designed and built by the Wrights themselves. And the engine powered an overhead line shaft that in turn powered several of the machine tools they were using when repairing and maintaining bikes. And we see three of those tools, uh, which all survive today. These are original to the Wright Cycle Shop and now are in the Wright Cycle Shop in Greenfield Village. We have the drill press there on the left. And uh, we know that they purchased that in 1898. It was built by WF and J Barnes Company. And uh, one of three different drill presses that they had used in their uh, cycle company operation at various times. Uh, this would have allowed for accurate, consistent drilling and uh, both obviously more powerful and more precise than a smaller handheld drill. The lathe we see there in the middle, uh, they acquired that uh, from the Putnam Machine Company in 1901, and it would have been used to remove uh, material from a metal workpiece. You would put a large piece of stock metal onto that machine and then remove uh, metal from it as you were shaping it. And as you look at it, it looks like there's a model of the right uh, engine there on it uh, for the airplane, but it would also have been used for machining parts 
for the bicycles as well. Of course, the lathe turns the workpiece as it's cut, which ensures a consistent and symmetrical result as you're working through there. Uh, this lathe was later used by the Wright Company, not to be confused with Wright Cycle Company. Wright Cycle built the bicycles, Wright Company built the airplane. So they held on to this for a long time. In fact, until the business was sold in 1915. And then we see the band saw there on the right, uh, made by the Crescent Machine Company, also used, of course, for bicycle repair and manufacture at Wright Cycle Company. The brothers bought that in 1899 and kept it for the next 10 years. And the bandsaw obviously allows straight uniform cuts, and it could also make curved or regular cuts as needed as well, with much greater precision than a handsaw. Now we're looking again inside the Wright Cycle Company building in Greenfield Village, and this is the back workroom where they would have been repairing bicycles, and we have it fitted out to look as though they've just perhaps stepped away for a break and are going to come back to the work soon. And uh, we just use this photo to illustrate the point that by 1898, the Wrights really had hit their stride with repairing bicycles with their own brands and with sales. Uh, they had an annual income largely from the cycle shop of about $2,000 or maybe $3,000 a year. So they were by no means wealthy or rich, but they had a successful small business and they were solidly in the middle class. But this is also the point here in 1898 and 1899 in particular, where their minds start to wander toward a new challenge. The Wrights had been interested in aviation from childhood. We probably all know the story about how their father, Bishop Wright, brought them back a toy helicopter from one of his many trips. They played around with it until it broke, and then rather than, than pout, they just built new ones of their own design. Uh, but it was a, a childhood fancy. A lot of children would have been fascinated with flying objects, obviously, at that time, as they still are today. But their adult interest in aviation is really rekindled in 1896. And, uh, Oddly enough, it comes out of a death. Uh, German aviator Otto Lilienthal was killed in a glider crash in 1898. Wilbur Wright read about it in the paper. It got him thinking about the problem of human flight again. They uh, started by looking at books in their father's own library on, on birds, on uh, aeronautical work, to whatever extent he might have had it, which would not have been too much. Then they went to the public library in Dayton, found more books, quickly read their way through all of those. So uh, the real Breakthrough moment comes on May 30th, 1899, when Wilbur Wright sits down to write this two-page letter to the Smithsonian Institution, basically asking for any advice on books, pamphlets uh, that they might purchase on aeronautical research, aeronautical efforts. And uh, my favorite uh, point in this letter is that uh, somewhere in there, uh, Wilbur writes that I am not a crank. I just have some theories about aviation, would like to learn more about it. And the Smithsonian came through for them. I think the letter was answered within three or four days. And the brothers were off on their way, purchasing a new series of books and uh, beginning serious formal work on the problem of human flight. Uh, we're back into the cycle shop now uh, and looking at the back room, which the brothers had added onto the building where they designed and built their first kites, gliders, and airplanes. Um, a modest machine shop. We saw the three tools that they use. All three of them can be seen in this photograph here. But uh, that modest equipment and the skills the brothers had used in uh, using those tools to make and repair bikes obviously served them very well in their aviation work. Skipping ahead in time just briefly so I can show you what the Kill Devil Hills looked like. Uh, the Wrights began their tests with kites in Dayton. There was a, an open field, Huffman Prairie, not too far outside of town where they could go and uh, test their kites. But if they were going to start working on larger gliders and Ultimately, they hoped an airplane, they were going to need some place with more dependable winds for these larger craft. Uh, they wrote to the U.S. Weather Bureau looking for advice, and based on windiest spots in the United States, they selected Kill Devil Hills on North Carolina's Outer Banks to be their outdoor laboratory. Uh, it provided steady winds, uh, open space, and soft sand dunes on which to land. We must remember in these days, every landing was more or less a crash landing. So you wanted a soft surface on which to land the airplane, not only for your own safety, but to protect the glider itself. So it didn't get mangled, uh, uh, or at least not any more mangled than necessary. Uh, they also chose Kill Devil Hills, I think, too, uh, because of the seclusion. It was difficult to reach it being out on the outer banks of North Carolina. They could work in some degree of privacy. Uh, the rights were uh, uh, incredibly insular. They had been raised uh, as a tight-knit family. They really didn't trust outsiders, uh, anyone outside of the family itself. So they would have wanted to work in privacy and seclusion as they uh, refined their techniques and their machines. 
Uh, here's a photo of the 1900 Wright glider, and it's uh, an interesting point that sometimes gets overlooked about the Wrights in the bicycle business. Uh, not only the skills and, and the techniques they developed selling bicycles, but also the seasonal nature of the work was a great advantage to the Wrights. Uh, obviously, the bike business slows down in the fall, which gives them the freedom and flexibility to travel out to North Carolina for a few weeks at a time to test their aircraft. Uh, we're looking here at the 1900 glider, which was controlled by a novel method, uh, wing warping, twisting the wings to change the shape of the wings ever so slightly to allow the aircraft to roll to the left or to the right. We also don't want to uh, forget Catherine Wright and the role that she played with the Wright brothers. Now, a lot of people, fortunately, more people now know more about the work she did uh, in the Wright's aviation endeavors, providing them with advice and encouragement as kind of a sounding board, but also traveling with them later on to uh, to France in 1909 and, and uh, really working as a salesman in a sense, promoting their, their efforts. But uh, she also helped with the bicycle business. Uh, in fact, she watched Wright Cycle Company in 1900 when the Wrights went off to North Carolina for the first time. Uh, the brothers had arranged for a couple of uh, friends to come in and handle the day-to-day the -day store operations as well as the repairs, but Catherine really had the final say. They were kind of working under her supervision. She'd go in and check on them, make sure everything was uh, proceeding as it should. And as we say time and again, Catherine was there providing essential support, feedback, and advice for her brothers and really uh, a critical part of their success. Uh, we mentioned briefly the wing warping technique used on the 1900 glider. This is another moment of inspiration that came straight out of the Wright Cycle Company. Uh, Wilbur was there mining the store uh, one evening in July of 1899, and he picked up one of those cardboard boxes on the shelf there, uh, a box for an inner tube, sort of long and, and rectangular, and he was kind of fiddling with it, twisting it back and forth. And as he did so, he had his uh, Eureka breakthrough where he realized if he could twist the shape of their glider wings in the same manner, he might be able to affect control of the aircraft. So the idea literally came out of the bicycle shop. Uh, the Wrights would go on to use their wing warping technique not only on all of their subsequent uh, gliders, but also, of course, on the 1903 Flyer. Uh, we're looking here at a picture of uh, three men who we should recognize here. On the uh, left is Orville Wright himself. On the right is Henry Ford. In the middle is uh, Charles Taylor. And uh, the brothers hired Charles Taylor in 1901 as their first employee at the Wright Cycle Company, or I should say really their first full-time employee there. They'd had friends helping out in the store, Catherine helping out from time to time, but uh, they realized now they needed someone there on a regular basis to really watch the shop as they were spending more and more time working on their aircraft. So uh, Taylor was skilled as a mechanic, and in fact, he later built the engine used in the 1903 Wright Flyer. And uh, the photo here was taken obviously much later than that in the 1930s when uh, Charles Taylor assisted both Orville and Henry Ford in relocating the right home and particularly the cycle shop from Dayton to Greenfield Village. Uh, Charlie helped with his own recollections of how the shop should have looked, but he also helped track down some of those machine tools that we looked at earlier. And what's really interesting to me is that uh, Taylor stayed around working as, uh, as a presenter out in the, the cycle shop, essentially. So if you come to visit Greenfield Village, in 1938 or 1939, you would have walked in there and seen Charlie Taylor himself uh, telling you how he literally <laughs> built the Wright Flyer alongside the Wright building, or Wright Brothers, rather. So no disrespect at all to our modern presenters. They're fantastic, but I, I don't know that it gets any better than walking in there and seeing Charlie Taylor himself. We're now looking at the 1901 Wright Glider, which, of course, was uh, sent out there after the work with the 1900 Glider. This was their largest yet. And although it did fly, uh, the wings did not produce as much lift as the brothers expected based on the calculations they had made using existing uh, tables of lift. Uh, so it was also proved rather difficult to control uh, based on it not producing as much lift as they thought. So the Wrights kind of wrote off the uh, 1901 glider as a failure. And uh, in fact, it led them to suspect that uh, there must be problems somewhere further down the line, not so much with their construction itself, but with the data on which they based their designs. Uh, they, they tell the story, uh, Wilbur, supposedly on their return from uh, the, uh, the Outer Banks in 1901, he was so despondent at the poor performance of the 1901 glider that he said, uh, 
know, man will fly, but it, it won't be for a thousand years. So uh, I love it because even amidst that uh, disappointment, there's still just that hint of optimism. He, he doesn't say man will never fly. He just says it won't be for a thousand years. So the brothers returned to Dayton with hope alive, if uh, somewhat diminished. And they decided that, well, if there is an error in that data, the only way they're going to find it and correct it is by developing their own aerodynamic data. So they begin with modifying a bicycle. We're looking again at that St. Clair bicycle to start to talk about what that funny third wheel is up on the handlebars. They built models of various wing foils of different shapes and different sizes and then mounted them on the wheel of that bicycle or the third wheel, I should say. And by riding the bicycle, they could generate a breeze that would then move that airfoil moving against a flat piece of metal on the other side. And Based on the shape of the foil, they determined whether, how much the wheel should spin, how fast it should spin. And uh, they quickly found out that something wasn't right, indeed, with the data that they had been, been using and taking on faith, basically. So these experiments really proved to them that they needed to start from the ground up. And the bicycle method clearly wasn't sophisticated enough for the kind of precise measurements they needed. So the brothers built their own wind tunnel. And we're looking at a replica of the tunnel, which was made for Greenfield Village here in 1938. But uh, they put this tunnel together, uh, operated by a, a fan driven off the same line shaft there, and they built a series of model foils and balances so they could measure precise, uh, per, excuse, per, excuse me, so they could measure precisely the lift generated by each different wing shape and uh, test them, test them again, recheck their figures again and again, and did all of this work in the 1127. Third Street Wright Cycle Shop, again, the building that survives in Greenfield Village today. And sure enough, based on those tests, of course, they determined that the data had been wrong. They produced their own data, and the next glider they built used their own data. And I want to pause for a moment here to uh, look at this cash register. This is not a cash register that belonged to the Wrights, nor was it used at uh, Wright Cycle Company, though certainly it is of the appropriate vintage. But I just wanted to make the point that the Wrights never received any outside funding for any of their aviation work. Now, at the same time, the Wrights were working particularly by 18 or by 1901, 1902. There were other people working on their own airplane designs, but many of them had funding from universities or colleges. Uh, some had funding from the military. The Wrights did not take uh, outside money. Uh, all of their trips to North Carolina, the wind tunnel, the gliders, the, the 1903 flyer, it had all been built from their own pockets, which meant effectively it, they had all been, been paid for based on profits from the Wright Cycle Company. Uh, and I think the Wrights, again, we talked about how sort of insular the family was and how, how they did not trust outsiders. Uh, the Wrights realized that if they were to take outside money, uh, it would jeopardize their independence. So they preferred to be entirely self-financed. Now we look at the 1902 Wright Glider, which is the first one that had been built based on the data that they developed with their wind tunnel in the Wright Cycle Shop. Uh, their work was rewarded very quickly in October 1902 when the 1902 Glider performed beautifully, uh, exceeded their expectations to the degree that the 1901 Glider had disappointed their expectations. Uh, the brothers made more than 700 glides in the fall of 1902, and some of them were more than 600 feet long, so tremendous improvement. Uh, they returned to the Outer Banks, of course, in 1903 uh, with a new aircraft equipped with engine and propellers. And uh, this is also an important point and, and one that seems a little strange. We think of the 1903 flyer and that first flight of December 17, 1903 as being the, the keystone moment. Uh, arguably, their 1902 glider flights were more important than what they accomplished in 1903, because in 1902, they proved not only the efficacy and accuracy of their aerodynamic data, but they proved the efficacy of their control system, that they could indeed warp the wings to steer the plane and not just go aloft at the pleasure of the wind, but actually control the direction to which they were going. So strange as it may sound, the, the brothers almost thought it was a problem of little consequence to add an engine and, and motorize the whole thing. And as it turned out to be, that was a fairly simple thing based on the road to the 1902 glider. So we're now looking at the replica of the 1903 Wright Flyer, which is located in Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation, really right at the heart of our Heroes of the Sky exhibit as well it should be. And we're looking at uh, the parts that make it unique from the 1902 glider, namely the engine here. And uh, it was a water-cooled four-cylinder engine, incidentally. We see the radiator up along the spar here. 
uh, but we also see uh, some of the elements of the bicycle that made their way into the 1903 flyer. Uh, most obviously, uh, the chain drive from the engine to the propellers, they're obviously taken directly from a bicycle. Uh, we also see the uh, wires here, which uh, doesn't take too much imagination to think of them as bicycle spokes, which provide support for the wheel, in this case, providing support for the, uh, the wing shape. Uh, another point that sometimes gets overlooked, I think, is the uh, steel tube frames that are used to support the propellers. And I've got one of them circled here. You can see, and of course, there's one on either side for either propeller. And if we turn the picture sideways and circle it again, I don't think it takes too much imagination to think of this as a bicycle frame. We could think of the seat post right here, maybe the seats on the top, the pedals would be down here. You'd have your rear wheel back here, your front wheel up front. So it's uh, really the, if not the direct shape, the technique used to build these uh, steel tube frames to support the propellers is right out of the bicycle business and bicycle frames. Another photo here, uh, and it is Orville who's flying the 1903 flyer. Incidentally, Wilbur did most of the flying the first couple of years that they went out to uh, the Kill Devil Hills in, in North Carolina. Uh, the only reason Orville took the first flight, they tossed a coin to see who would have the honor of making what they thought would be a successful first flight. Wilbur actually won the time coin toss, but as he went to take off in the flyer, he, he pitched up just a little too steeply, so the plane uh, crashed. They had to uh, pause, of course, for a few days to make necessary repairs, and then fair being fair because Wilbur had his turn, Orville got to take his turn at the controls for that flight on December 17th, 1903, when it did lift off the ground. Uh, traveled for 12 seconds, covered a distance of 120 feet, and in that short time and short distance, obviously changed the world. But I wanted to point out Wilbur here. You see he's laying prone on the wing. He's uh, got a number of controls there. Uh, he's controlling the elevator in the front to adjust the, uh, the, the sort of pitch of the airplane using the lever of his hand. But the wing warping, he's controlling with a cradle that he's laying in with his hip. So he would kind of shift side to side to make it happen. And uh, that was really the key breakthrough of the Wright Flyer, uh, not just uh, the wing warping technique itself, but the whole idea of wing warping. A lot of people had been trying to design airplanes that were inherently stable, something you could climb into, you could pilot, you could trust it to remain more or less level and responsive in the air. Uh, the Wrights realized that that was a tall order and probably impossible, that they were going to have to instead learn how to control an unstable aircraft if they were going to make their airplanes work. And this is exactly like riding a bike. Uh, as we climb onto a bicycle for the first time, you know, when we're kids and those training wheels come off, uh, it, it's a nervous thing, right? That bicycle is very wobbly until you get up to speed. You learn that you have to control that bicycle. And uh, even today as adults, people who've ridden bikes for decades are making all kinds of subtle movements and shifts in their body weight to keep that bicycle upright, to take corners at whatever speed they might be turning. And it becomes second nature, like riding a bike, the famous phrase. Uh, the right flyer uh, is operated a bit like that. It was challenging for the rights to fly it at first. They kind of had to build their craft and then learn how to fly it, which is what they really spent the next few years doing after the success in December, 1903. But they, they knew that if they could handle riding a bicycle, then eventually it would become second nature to control an airplane, which indeed it did, given enough practice. So that is really the genuine breakthrough there. Even at its most uh, basic there, the rights control system is a bit like a bicycle's. Um, and we're looking here at a photo of the Wright Flyer uh, at Kill Devil Hills in 1903. I should, I suppose, say here just for a moment, uh, a lot of people still refer to the first flight as having taken place at Kitty Hawk. Uh, I've tried to be consistent with Kill Devil Hills here, and uh, there's good reason for that confusion. When the Wrights were making these flights in 1901, 1902, 1903, uh, there was no community of Kill Devil Hills. The nearest city was Kitty Hawk City. I'm doing the air quotes. You can't see me, but I'm doing it. It was a small settlement, but about four miles away from where they did the actual testing. They did test in the Kill Devil Hills, which were really just sand dunes because they gave them kind of some elevation. They could, could launch going downhill there with their first gliders. Uh, today, in 2022, there is a community of Kill Devil Hills, and indeed that is where the Wright uh, Monument and, and Visitor Center is located if you go out to visit that. Um, but when 
They sent out their first telegram confirming the success of the first flight in 1903. It was datelined Kitty Hawk because that's the telegraph office that it, it went out of. So uh, you can again make an argument for either Kitty Hawk or Kill Devil Hills as being the location. But if we're talking about 1903, Kitty Hawk would be the community. Kill Devil Hills would be the geographic feature in which the flights actually took place. And we'll end with uh, undoubtedly one of the most famous photographs of all time here, showing the moment of liftoff on the right flyer there with uh, Wilbur Wright running alongside the wings and Orville there at the controls. And I just wanted to end by saying that Wright's cycle company closed, but surprisingly it didn't close until 1908. At that point, the Wrights had founded the Wright Company. They were fully now committed to building airplanes. Uh, and it was just as well. By 1908, the bicycle boom itself was over and done. Uh, personal transportation was now the domain of the automobile. People were more interested in motorized vehicles than they were in bicycles. And it's strange, but really bicycles for a lot of the 20th century were thought of as, as sort of a, a children's vehicle, right? Something kids ride until they're old enough to drive a car. Really not until the late 60s, early 70s with the advent of the 10 speed bike and, and the exercise craze that the bicycle comes back. And uh, happy to say that adults can ride bicycles and do ride bicycles now. It's no longer stigmatized as a child's vehicle and, and bicycling really in, in a sense is as popular as it's ever been, even if uh, if we're driving cars now, but uh, far more recreational riders out there now than there were for much of the 20th century. But uh, the bicycles gave the rights, the skills, the money, and the insight to build the first airplane, which I would say uh, not a bad legacy. So with that said, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and we'll see if we can answer a few questions if there are any here. Thank you so much for that excellent program, Matt. Um, I have to say that your bicycle pun early in the presentation really spoke to me as well. <laughs> good, good. I was good laughing job. for a while after that one. I, I can't um, resist the drowners. So. Yeah. I'd like to uh, now move to Q&A. As I see we have a few questions in the queue, um, please keep sending them in. We'll get to as many as we can during the remainder of our time together. So. Our first question is, when was the tire tube introduced? Oh, that, that's an excellent question. I, we talked about Wilbur doing his uh, twisting the box experiment there in July of 1899. And I think the tube had been introduced a year or 18 months prior to that. So uh, new technology at the time that, that Wilbur was working with it. And of course, uh, inner tube tires became important for automobiles and a lot of technology. You know, we talked about the airplanes, but a lot of bike technology made its way into early automobiles as well. But I think the more important point is that the inner tube having been introduced just a year before and the rights are already stocking them and selling them. They took pride in their bicycle business. They made a point of staying on the cutting edge of what was going on in bicycle technology. So perhaps not surprising that they had inner tubes that early on in their uh, their existence. Thank you. Um, next question. So they shared it's an interesting path from printing to bicycles to aviation, undoubtedly so. Uh, did the brothers ever have an interest in the automobile? Oh, that, that's a good question, too. They, they certainly saw automobiles uh, running around Dayton. We're kind of fascinated by them. In fact, there are stories of them seeing them and, uh, and being curious. Uh, they, they never tried to build their own. Uh, they did actually contact a couple of uh, automobile companies uh, when it came time to putting the engine in the right flyer. Uh, they were well aware of what was going on in the automotive world. In fact, that's part of the reason they thought it would be so easy to put an engine on the flyer because they could just buy one from a, a secondhand vendor or a, a third period hand supplier. But uh, as it turned out, they, they found it was just easier to build their own with Charlie Taylor, who did a lot of the design work on that. It was an aluminum block, obviously, to save weight. But uh, no, it's curious. You can imagine a different world where the rights might have uh, evolved from bicycles to automobiles and uh, could have built cars, but I think we're all probably better off that they went in the direction they did. I think so. Specialized in, in flight, for sure. <laughs> uh, did they have a local dynamo or something to power the belt machines that they used? Uh, they were using a, a natural gas engine that they had designed and built themselves. It had been first used at the 22 Williams shop site, which is still there in Dayton. I think I mentioned if you, if you get a chance, by all means, go down there. It's a fantastic visitor center. You can see it. You can also see, I have to admit, I felt a little guilty about this. You can walk over to where the house used to be, and they have, uh, they have it all set out with concrete markers in the ground. So you can see the outline of the house. But of course, we know 
the house is now in Greenfield Village. Uh, but yes, they used that natural gas engine, and then they moved it over to the uh, the building at 1127 West Third Street, and that was used to operate the the machinery being an overhead line shaft. And the engine we have out in Wright Cycle Company is accurate to how the original looked. It is not the original engine, though. That did not survive. Uh, so are the machine tools that the Wright brothers used, like the lathe, on display at either the museum or the village? Yes, those tools are all on display. If you go into uh, Wright Cycle Company, you go through the, the storefront in the front where you see the bikes and the accessories and so forth. It's in the very back room where we have uh, a portion of uh, the 1903 flyer set up there. You can see the, the machine tools in place just as they would have been in 1903. Thank you. Um, next question, was the first flight from the ground or from the Jockey Ridge? Oh, that's an excellent question too. Uh, they had been launching their gliders uh, from, from the hill, the dunes, as I mentioned, so they could kind of get a downhill start when they were taking off, which, which made sense. But uh, one of their real goals in 1903 was to launch from the level ground. They thought by that time that it was cheating, we might say, if you were trying to use gravity to help you. They still wanted a good headwind, but they wanted to launch from level ground. So they devised a, um, a rail, a monorail, a wooden rail that they balanced the flyer on and then propelled it along its way to take off. Uh, later, when they started flying at uh, Huffman Prairie in Dayton, where they didn't have the steady winds that they had at uh, at Kill Devil Hills, they uh, invented a, a catapult device. They had a large weight up on a derrick. They would drop the weight, which was connected by rope to the flyer, and it would pull it along the rail to give them a head start, which, uh, it, and obviously the uh, derrick was behind the flyer in the direction it would be taking off from, but it must have been something to see that device in use. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry there isn't a replica of that around somewhere. Yeah, this, this might be kind of in tandem, but another question, did they invent or improve upon the wind tunnel? Yeah, they, they did not invent the wind tunnel. Others had been using them at that point for uh, other aeronautical work, but uh, nevertheless, the, the, they were able to build one and, and discover that the data of lift, you know, what how much lift a certain wing of a certain shape or a certain camber should be producing, uh, that was their real breakthrough, being able to determine that information from their uh, wind tunnel. And again, we have a replica of that out in uh, Wright Cycle Company, so you can get a sense of the size and shape of the thing. Great, thank you. We did have another question to see if the one on display is was actually used, but you just shared it's a replica? Correct, yes. It, it Again, it made accurately with, with Orville's blessing, which is another phenomenal thing to think that he was actually helping with this work. So it feels like there's an extra measure of authenticity there. Absolutely. Uh, this is interesting. How much would the original bicycle that the brothers made be worth in today's economy? Ooh. I, I, it's it's a cop out, but I'll say priceless. <laughs> there, are, there are so few of those bicycles out there. I think we said only three hundred made to begin with, and only seven, to my knowledge, that still survive. They, they never trade hands. They don't sell at auction. Uh, I think most, if not all, of them are in in control of museums. So, it would be hard to put a price on something like that. Yeah, understand that. Um, and which books would you recommend about the Wright brothers? Yeah, thank you. I was hoping someone would ask. Yes, <laughs> we, we mentioned the uh, David McCullough book, The Wright Brothers, which I, I like that one because it's, uh, um, I, I say breezy, and I don't say that as a pejorative. I just mean it's a page turner, right? It's enjoyable because he's so great with the narrative. He also goes to great lengths to give Catherine her due, which is nice to see. Uh, but I also really like... Uh, Tom Crouch, a curator at the uh, Air and Space Museum, wrote a book called The Bishop Boys and published, oh gosh, probably close to uh, 40 years ago now. But I think it's still sort of the standard reference work on the Wright brothers. We are fortunate that the Wrights were uh, journal, uh, I say journalists, not reporters, but journal keepers, right? Keeping diaries. They were also great correspondents writing detailed letters to the family. So a lot of papers survived to help uh, Crouch put that book together. But that's, I think, the place to go if you want a real in-depth uh, look at the brothers and their lives. Thank you. Uh, do you by chance know who gets the, the photo credit for the first successful flight? Uh, yes, it, it is John T. Daniels, who was one of the uh, it, well, the, the forerunner of the Coast Guard, the Life Saving Service, right? They were they had a station there near where the Wrights Brights were flying. Uh, the Wrights called over some of the, the crew members there to help them get the plane set up. Orville set up the tripod with the camera and, and just kind of showed Daniels how the camera worked. He said, you know, if something interesting happens, squeeze this bulb to take the picture. So Daniels had never taken a photo in his life until he happened to take 
one of the most significant photos of all time. So very funny. That's wonderful. Um, I believe this is the last question we're going to have time for today. Um, are you aware if the Schwinn Company in Chicago um, was ever mentioned by the Wright brothers as a supplier or competitor since they were founded um, late 1800s? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I have not seen Schwinn mentioned in conjunction with the Wrights. As, as I say, they, uh, they, they stuck to the higher end bicycles. So I, I know they had um, bikes. I think they carried a few imported brands from the UK. And uh, they, they sort of stayed away from the Columbia, the Pope, and, and perhaps the Schwinn as well, being lower end on the market. Uh, again, because of their sort of insistence on quality and all things. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. I know we weren't even able to get to all of them, but we really appreciate your attentiveness and for joining today's program. Um, we're so grateful that you continue to connect with us in all aspects. Uh, we'd love to give a special thank you to our ongoing supporting partner and membership, DFCU Financial. And whether it's our new heroes and villains, the art of the Disney costume exhibit, a Ford Rouge factory tour, or a bicycle ride through Greenfield Village during our Twilight Bike Ride event. I look forward to seeing you all at the Henry Ford soon.